and welcome to the Rediscovering Play podcast brought to you by Biba. I'm your host, Mike Rosen. As we've previously discussed, our mission at Biba and the goal of this podcast is to investigate, explore, and question what it means to play for kids in this modern era. Whether that's through building mobile games designed to get kids back out on playgrounds to get the physical activity that they need, or doing a deep dive into parenting tips in this new technological age, we are committed to rediscovering the idea of play for today's families. And what better time to be rediscovering play? While many of us are finding ourselves spending way more time inside and working from home these days, it's understandable that we might be trying to figure out how best to maintain a sense of normalcy and how to avoid going completely stir-crazy while cooped up indoors. This is especially true for parents who are dealing with the fact that their children are home, schools are closed, playdates and activities are limited, and on top of that, kids have questions about what's going on in the world and parents need to know how best to answer them appropriately. How do we maintain a sense of play in these trying times? How do we play with our children in a way that's both fun and safe? How do we maximize the limits of our confined spaces to make sure that our kids are still able to get the physical activity that they need? On this next series of episodes of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, we aim to answer these questions and more through conversations with parents, childcare workers, medical staff, and various other industry professionals to provide you with helpful tips and tricks, new perspectives, and fresh insights to help ensure that you and your family can stay happy, healthy, and active while we navigate this new current at-home situation. Join us while we rediscover play together. On today's episode of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, our guest is Allison Schaefer. Allison is one of Canada's leading parenting experts. She promotes a firm but friendly democratic parenting style and offers practical solutions backed by extensive evidence-based research. She's an Adlerian family counselor, author, and internationally acclaimed expert who empowers families by sharing her principles, rules, and tools for raising cooperative and resilient kids. Armed with years of research, clinical, and field experience, Allison can provide a new, positive understanding of your current family dynamic with actionable solutions that will give you hope and confidence needed to transform your family. On today's episode, Allison talks to us about how important it is to try and manage family dynamics when conflicts arise, and the best way to sort of de-escalate those conflicts when they do happen. These sorts of challenges are inevitable these days with these shelter-in-place regulations, so hopefully you'll learn quite a bit from this episode and find it entertaining too. Here's Allison. Hey, Allison, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to have this uh, conversation. Yeah, it's funny. Everybody seems so busy these days, but at the same time, everybody's busy at home. So for better or for worse, it's, 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 it's been always appreciated when people are able to make it on, but it seems like people are always eager to be able to make it on and be a part of this. So I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to be part of this conversation today. So, I mean, one, one of the big things that I wanted to at least start our conversation off with is the fact that, you know, this, this profound paradigm shift that we find ourselves in because of the, this coronavirus pandemic and all the shelter in place regulations means that, you know, there's a ton of opportunity for families to be spending a lot of time together, uh, which, which can be great. And sometimes that can be quality time. But what it also means is that there's increasing possibilities and opportunities for things to boil over. And I know it's not really something I've seen discussed too often, but I think it's something that everybody is definitely feeling is that, you know, with tensions being higher, with everybody sort of just being in close confined spaces, it's, it's almost unexpected and or it very much expected and, and natural that there could be tensions or fights or arguments between parents and children. And um, I wanted to maybe give you a chance to sort of talk about what you've been hearing and, and, and advice that you might have for parents who find themselves in situations who have, you know, feeling like they, they're about to blow up with their child or they've just had a big argument and fight with their child. Yeah, and, and no doubt if they have, they're feeling really lousy. Pa mm. Parents are just, you know, so great at feeling guilty. <laughs> it's just so, so so good at feeling like, you know, hashtag not my best parenting moment and open up the bank account now because I know they're gonna, I'm going to have to pay for their therapy later. We're, we're just so hard on ourselves. Um, you know, and I guess what, what I'd like to share with the public is, is uh, you know, the, the realization that we have a romantic idea about the nuclear family and its beauty 
and it's it's really been marketed to us, but it's actually pretty artificial. We we never really lived in these small little nuclear families until very very recently in history. Um, that that we were always meant to be part of a larger community. Um, that that the, the whole notion of it takes a village or it takes a tribe or you know we're supposed to live in longhouses where where our kids would be under the supervision, guidance, and mentorship of many adults. And part of it wasn't just exposure to these other great adults in our lives, but literally to be a buffer because it's so easy for strains and stresses to, to be part of our most intimate relationships. And if you think about that, think about, you know, people that come home for, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. And even though they're in their thirties, they go right back into their old childhood roles with their siblings. And, you know, a million people can criticize them, but you know, when mother criticizes, why are you, why haven't you gotten your hair cut? Or how come you haven't found a man or whatever it is? We, we just can't, when we hear it from our nuclear family, it just lands on us differently than anybody else talking to us. And so we've lost all the buffers. We're, we're in these most intimate relationships that we put so much care about that it also means that they're the ones that, that know our Achilles heels, know our buttons, uh, push us more than other relationships. And, and we're stuck here for a really long time. And we're being asked to both work and go to school and, and have these other demands on us. It's really a recipe for th that, that, of course, you're going to boil over. Of, of course, it's of, of course, it's not going to be unicorns and rainbows. It, it's, it's a terrible situation. Um, so I would to, to, to just be kind and to know, hey, you know, we're just we're all just asking people to do our best to get through it, you know? Yeah. And also, I think remembering that, like, a lot of these Pinterest parenting photos and stuff that people see are very much those they're manufactured things that are not necessarily representative of real life. But it's people who have curated photo shoots around these things to point to how perfect their 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 parenting experiences during these times and to not hold hold ourselves as parents to those same expectations because they are impossible to achieve. It's funny how we somehow uh, can understand and um, feel like we need to intervene with our teens and how our teens are being swayed by images and conversations and um, influences of social media when they're in adolescence. And we don't actually look at how adults are influenced by social media. We, we, to your point, when you start flipping through social media and you think, has everybody made sourdough bread but me? Has everybody made the, the um, crystal coffee um, whip that is the new topping of the day? Is everybody um, doing videos of their family learning how to do a cooperative TikTok dance and posting it on social? And you think, oh my goodness, all I did was scream at my kids all day and to try to get them to sit in their seat and do their homework. And you know, what is this other utopia? Uh, and yet, you know, we think we're adults and that we're immune to this influence, but we're not. We, we, we uh, are, it's very common to want to compare ourselves to how other people are doing and to create some kind of a ranking system that says they're doing better and we're doing less well. And that, that's a very critical uh, perspective that it brings us nothing but unhappiness, really. It's not, it doesn't help the situation. Yeah, and that's sort of that double whammy of like the two things that you mentioned, you know, like our village that we have 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 grown reliant on and also there's a reason why we are reliant on has been removed and everyone's spending way more time on their screens and on social media and looking at other things. So you don't have the support system that you're used to and you're spending way more time looking at these sort of unrealistic expectations of what your parenting life should be. And like those two things together are just are crushing. Yeah, and we have to remember, you know, no, nobody knew that this was coming. We weren't hired for our jobs to be remote workers. If we were hired to be remote workers, we probably would have made sure that we had a space in our house or bought a house or a big, bigger, you know, a third bedroom apartment, condo, whatever it is, wherever people are living. We would have made sure it had windows and a proper desk and chair for ergonomics. And we would have done all kinds of other considerations, but we were thrown into this. 
So we have to remember this is more like you're trying to get something done while you're at home. And the same with homeschooling. Making a decision to become a homeschooling parent is taken up by very few of the population. Uh, it often creates other problems in the relationship. And none of us were, were signed up to do this, that this is really not about becoming a homeschooler. This is about can our kids actually like try to get a few things done and maybe try to normalize the ex try to create some normalcy. Some kids really miss their teachers. They really miss their classmates. Uh, so depending on how each school is, is, is managing things, but nobody was suddenly expected to be a nine to three thirty teacher of their children on, on top of potentially a job to earn an income. And so the, 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 the expectation is being not put on by the employer and the school boards. The expectation is being put on by us. We, we think we're all that. We think we have to do it to these um, high standards of, of what that might have looked like pre-COVID. And it's just a formula that is not, not doable, nor accurate, nor required. Right. I think that's a really good point is that, you know, it's, it's a self-inflicted wound in so many different ways, you know, like even, even within the family dynamic, there was no opportunity for people to have a conversation to say like, Hey, we're gearing up for this thing in two weeks, we're going to be in this situation. It sort of just happened overnight. So even for, you know, parents and children, depending on the, the age of the children, or even, you know, amongst parents for in, in a marriage or whatever the relationship might be to be able to sit down and say like, Hey, there's going to be challenges. We need to sort of set some ground rules first or figure out what this is going to look like or or have a safe word or whatever you need to do when you're feeling that that sort of tension and stress like there wasn't there wasn't really time for that prep work so everyone was kind of thrown in and um you know especially for parents are feeling like it's on them to have all of these answers when the truth of the matter is nobody knows what the answers are um, we're all in this for the first time we have no idea how much longer this is going to continue for and the longer we're in the situation the more the more tension and the more you know, the, the more opportunities there are for people to not reach those unrealistic expectations that they've set for themselves are, right? Yeah. And also, you know, <laughs> I, I, I work with a lot of teachers and a lot of schools, and I, I just feel like I need to give a little shout out to them. When this started here anyways, in uh, where I am in Canada was, um, it was during March, our school's March break. And so parents were kind of like, oh, okay, well, it's March break. We're used to, you know, being off anyways, although a lot of people had to come home from Florida and things. Um, but then it was like, oh, so they're not going back to school. So it's going to be, oh, it's like a long March break. And then it, then the, the complaint of parents was, what am I supposed to do with these kids? What, what are we going to do all day? And then the next thing that came along was the schools actually said, oh, we've got all these parents who don't know what to do with their kids all day. And we know that they should have some structure. And we know that they should be looking at something other than, you know, mindlessly wasting their time let's try to send some some links and some activities and create some scheduling that could be helpful to create some more um, sense of predictability in a student's in in the life of the family in the life of the student life of the child and then of course the parents took it as what now i have to do this too how am i supposed now i'm overwhelmed but i have to get all this done <laughs> so we we went from we got nothing for, for the the kids to do to now we get too much to managing the kids and like I said, it's the intent of the school board, they responded so quickly. They got stuff up pretty, pretty fast. Um, they also didn't have time to prepare. They, they, these are also teachers who have kids that are now in um, um, lockdown with their families that are scrambling to try to figure out what they need to do for their students and things. And um, so, so from both, both ends, everyone's just like struggling too much, too little, too much, too little, that you as the person in the family leading the family uh, need to kind of just cut through that and just say, what does our family need? What's important right now? The most important thing right now is that we get rid of this disease that we get, you know, that we get our vaccination, that we support our frontline workers and we don't spread it, stay home. Right. Mm -hmm. do all the good hygiene things. And the second thing is to come out of this. The number, the, the number two worry um, is that we are going to have a global mental health crisis and that's unprecedented in our history. So the second thing is to think about how do we keep our mental health? Um, you know, so to, to get upset about your kid, not getting their homework done to me is a little bit like straightening the deck chairs on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And also I think 
like you mentioned, you know, the, those potential mental health questions and issues and, and, and the stresses of, of adjusting to this and not really knowing what the reality is and having a hard time trying to figure out how to sort of transition to the situation that we've been in now, that's not something that's uniquely felt by parents. I mean, children are feeling those things also, which is probably leading towards potentially difference in behavioral patterns or issues or whatever it might be. And it's so easy, I think, for parents to think like, you're making my life more difficult when the challenge is like, everyone's lives are being made more difficult. And it's, it's sometimes hard to sort of remove yourself from it, but recognize like tensions are high for everyone. A lot of people are probably feeling really anxious about this and, and, and there's a lot of unknowns and everyone's trying to figure it out and sort it out. No one's trying to harm anybody through this process. Everyone's just trying to make, everyone's trying to just make their way through it without, without, um, you know, too much damage. Um, but the result of those things, I think, especially when things are getting heated, could be, you know, additional tensions caused by not understanding those things and thinking that people are trying to be malicious with their intent or, you know, encroaching on your space on the desk, not knowing that that was something that was really going to bother you and it turns into a fight. Yeah, it, well, it's true. You know, it's we're a system under pressure. And when we're under pressure, that's when we're more likely to be reactive rather than responsive. Uh, and maybe a good way of thinking about this, there's just so much great work now that we've, from neurobiologists and neuropsychology and whatnot, that we're understanding so much more about the brain, not only for us to understand it, but also so that we can explain it to kids who have trouble with their emotional regulation, as do parents, because we snap, you know. Um, but we, you know, we talk about going to the upstairs brain, the higher brain, and the upstairs brain goes slower, but it does more executive functioning, more long-term planning, more consideration, weighing pros and cons, all that kind of stuff. And the down downstairs brain is more that reptilian brain that that uh, brain that is wrapped around safety protection survival um, basic uh, functionings and that's where our, our, our fight freeze flee response resides and it's wrapped up in in um, you know memories of past fears and things and so that's the downstairs brain and um, when when we have a perception of threat when we think resources are scarce or we're threatened in some way, um, the downstairs brain says in order to survive, we're going to turn off the upstairs brain. Uh, it's too slow. It's too bulky. It's not. <laughs> and, and, and so we do tend to be a very um, re reflexive, um, automatic without thinking. And boom, we blurt out that thing, you know, I wish you were never born. And then, you know, of course, when we calm down, we're like, Oh man, I can't believe I, in a, in a, heated moment I blurted that out I feel so bad you know mm -hmm. um and so right now there's a lot of things that make us feel like our security is is threatened are we going to get food am I going to get this disease am I going to lose my job or, you know will there be enough um coverage for debt relief that I'm, I'm not going to lose the house I mean there's a lot going on for parents but to your point so so is there for kids little kids don't uh, have a lot of say and voice and choice in their lives. Um, not like adults do. I mean, basically we just thrust things upon them, right? You're in grade three and you're going to be in Mrs. So-and-so's class. And in the summer, you're going away to camp for two years and we've signed you up for badminton. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and you're going to this birthday party on the weekend and here's the gift you're taking. There's so much that we do that we don't give our kids any say in. And uh, so they feel kind of yanked around and they feel a little more powerless and they feel a, a lot less control. And, uh, and so the more that we can help life be, help them increase their sense of agency and control, the more they're going to settle down and so, then their fear responses are going to come down and they'll work more out of their ups upstairs brain the more they do the more we will because we're not reacting to kids misbehaving so i think like just basic things like getting a schedule you know i mean i i know lots of parents hate schedules maybe they think it's they'd rather just go with the flow and be easy breezy but but kids need to have some sense of expectation and anticipation and in the end even if you just put a couple of things on your schedule things that you know for example meal times Okay, maybe you don't know exactly when dinner is going to be, but you know you have dinner sometime between five and seven. Um, you know, you know, you've probably been having the same rough bedtime for your kids, but we could like name it and label it. And putting on things are like, when will you play with them? Because I, I hate to say this, Mike, but one of the things that parents forget to do, even though we're home all the time, sometimes we're so busy dealing with our kids and managing our kids and managing the household, the last thing we remember to do is play. Mm -hmm. Weirdly. So, um, so, you know, to be able to say to your kids, yes, you know, we're going to make sure that we 
play this afternoon. This is our play time, whatever, whatever age stage, whatever you can find something age appropriate for the whole family. Then your kids are much less likely to bug you all day because they're able to know that they can delay their gratification and say, nope, that's okay. Playtime is at three. They're going to stop working and make an hour for us. And, and so they can be more patient if, if you really do follow through with holding that commitment. And the same with, with um, screen time. You know, if you can say the iPad time is this time in the afternoon, then they are less likely to run around trying to sneak it, hide it, lie about it, fight about getting off of it because it's, there's this um, expectation. It's on the schedule. This is when we have it. We're going to have it again tomorrow. You don't have to beg for it. So I think those things do help our kids feel like life is more predictable, feel like they have more control. Um, you know, and, and, and certainly if you co-create the schedule with them, it, it makes them feel like they had a voice and all those things I think are, are helpful. Right. And I would imagine that beyond sort of just the expectation that it sets in the understanding and, and, and the agency that you're giving them to sort of create that, that structure with with you, but also them understanding, okay, this is the time for this thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to follow these rules. I would imagine also for parents, it, it reduces how overwhelming all the sort of things that need to happen in the house feel because you're breaking them down into the more micro tasks and saying, okay, I know I have to work and I know I have to take care of my kid and I know I need to homeschool and I need to manage their school time and their, their screen time and I need to do the dishes, I need to do the laundry and all these things. But if you're worrying about all of them together, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. If you're breaking it down into sort of the individual micro tasks in a schedule, then you can start to feel good as you're ticking things off of your list as the day goes on. And you know, I don't have to worry about the dishes now because I've got time set aside to make sure that that happens in an hour or whatever it might be. Also, one of the most surprising things that, you know, when we, I, there's been so many positive outcomes that have actually come from, um, uh, people being in this environment together. And, and that is parents reporting, oh my gosh, I had no idea how capable my children were. That, that you know, it is, a lot of it is um, the excuse that, I don't know if excuse is, the, that sounds judgmental, but the reason that parents often cite for not giving their kids responsibility or working on handing over responsibility to their, to their kids is that, that there's just so little time that it's just easier to do it themselves. You know, if you got to get out the door and your kid's refusing to put on their shoes, it's just easier to help get the shoes on them. You know, if you know that they're supposed to make their bed, but, you know, they're going to be late for the school bus, you know what, fine, take a pass on it, make it for them. There's a lot that parents have done in the name of needing to be punctual and needing to keep spinning all these plates without any of them falling. And so now with parents having time and not having this issue of punctuality, suddenly they're realizing, wow, like my kids actually do load and unload the dishwasher and can make a meal and like cooking in the kitchen and like working in the garden. And suddenly we've got all these helpers and all these kids who can be independent and really showing up as a, a helper in the family in ways that parents had never made space or appreciated or recognized before. So there's, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you have lots of help around you. If you can just step back and, and, and spend the time to, to do some delegation and be okay with maybe things being a little not to your standard, but at least, at least done. Um, and that can be really hard for, especially for moms, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not saying that dads are, uh, it's individual, but I would say in general, moms have felt that it, that the onus was on them and they're not good at asking for help. And they like to maintain control by doing things to their own standard, their own way on their own timetable. So, um, uh, kids like to help. They really do. Yeah. And delegating those tasks sort of also, I mean, it takes a few boxes in that it gets the task done. It also keeps your child occupied and gives them a sense of, of pride, hopefully in, in what they're doing to contribute towards keeping the house sort of clean or, or maintained in whatever way. And, um, you know, that in itself is empowering and gives them agency, but also takes up their time and reduces something off of your plate that you had to do. So, uh, you know, pos positives all around. Absolutely. You know, uh, when uh, when I'm teaching my parenting classes, the, the main construct that I'm trying to get parents to understand is that the methodologies that, that I'm teaching have an end goal of raising a child who is cooperative. And that sounds really, uh, you know, obtuse, like, of course. But the truth is, we 
came from a society where most of our parenting discipline tactics were actually designed to raise kids who were obedient to the will of their parents. I mean, any parent who says that they're frustrated because their kids won't listen <laughs> is, is suffering with a child who is, is unwilling to be obedient, uh, you know, to their, to their commands and their requests. And part of what has to happen for a child to want to volunteer their cooperation in order to want to help the family is based on a set of conditions. And one of those conditions is mutual respect. To, to, feel, to not feel one up or one down, to not feel that you were in a subservient domination style, slave tyrant, you know, puppet, puppet master style relationship. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to actually feel a tremendous sense of, of connectivity, it, um, belonging in the group, you know, so such that you would subvert your own personal needs in order for the group to thrive. Just like if you were on a soccer team and you really wanted to win the pennant and you knew that you weren't necessarily the person with the best odds of, of um, scoring a goal, you'd rather bench yourself and say, no, no, put out the good guy. We want to win the pennant because when, when we get the pennant, we all win together. We all get to celebrate that win. And so part of how we create feelings of cohesion and belonging and connection in social groups, including the family, is for people to contribute. You know, you can, you can go to church over and over and over again and just sit in the pew and listen to the service, but you don't feel like you're a member of the congregation until you like join a committee or start serving coffee or, you know, collect the hymn books or whatever. It's, it's the doing, it's the helping that makes you feel the bond. And we generally just raise kids to be these like inert tumors on the family. And all we ask them to do is to be smart at school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's no wonder there's a sense of alienation and, and non-connectivity and non-cooperation in the family. So here we are all at home. What a great opportunity to build the team, build the team by getting those kids to, to contribute, not as free indentured servants. That's, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, I mean, you can try it, but, um, but like to really be thankful for the help that they're offering to really be interested in the contributions um, that they want to make and they might they might look differently. It might not all be janitorial services like clean the bathroom and you know walking the dog. You know, we can ask them to to be make the food, make the food list and order it from the food delivery place or um you know to to help put up shelves in the garage and learn how to use power tools together. There's there's lots of we gotta think outside the box, I think. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I think it's a super interesting point. And I think like you had sort of mentioned before, these are our tasks or, or opportunities that may not have presented themselves from a parenting perspective if we were sort of in the, the, the former world, quote unquote, where, you know, everyone was running around and was so hyper scheduled and there was always that that sort of the excuse, like you said, about like we've got to get out the door so there's no time for an opportunity to be able to teach this thing. So there's always rushing people around and I would imagine that, you know, that scenario that we had been in, which was, you know, constantly running around, ushering people out the door and going to school and going to programs and going to play dates and all these other things means that there's probably other gaps that people might have in their sort of parenting skills tool book that they haven't had a chance to sort of foster or develop because of all that running around that now people are being confronted with needing to, for the first time, either consider or for the first time, spend time to really hone. Yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting too. I've been um, specifically working with a bunch of teens who have said a couple of things, you know, because we know that it's part of ad the adolescent journey and developmentally appropriate for teens to want to um, socialize more with their peers, be more sensitive to peer acceptance and rejection. Um, because after all, you will spend the majority of your adult life out of your nuclear home and working and living and cohabitating with peers. So that's a really important thing to figure out for sure. Um, but, you know, as teens try to make space, they, they tend to isolate even before COVID, you know, they want to like hang out in their bedroom or they want to go meet their friends at the mall or whatever. And, um, and so they kind of drift and parents lose touch with their teens. So here we are now in COVID and we're forced to be at home and yeah, the kids are still staying up late, get a lot of complaints about, you know, oh, they're up till the middle of the night but that's their way of finding some privacy when you're in confinement. Um, but they're also saying because we're home together 
and they can't kind of <laughs> escape um, with their peers. Things are starting to happen around the home that is building up those relationships. You know, the, the one uh, son was saying to me like, oh, my dad was getting a coffee and normally like I wouldn't have gone out of my way to text my dad this at work, but because he was sort of standing there, I happened to mention something I read in the paper and then he responded. And next thing you know, we were having this deep conversation about something. He said, that never would have happened in the past. And he said, and now that my dad's working from home, I'm overhearing his phone conversations. And I used to be mad at him for the kind of loving his job and not being home much. But now I'm realizing my dad is really respected and he works really hard. So there's a, a lot of getting to know one another that has been really, really, really interesting and I think important to building some of these relationships. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. It's about like the, the walls breaking down in terms of understanding or at least like putting yourself in one other's shoes and understanding what it is that they're doing to contribute towards the home or, or, or what they're about in terms of like you mentioned things like work ethic or character or are they interested in this thing that I might be interested in but you know maybe it's not cool to want to talk to my dad when I'm a teenager and my other friends are you know around but if your friends aren't around then who else are you going to talk to other than your dad right? So um, some really interesting things that are happening there. And I think that these are all like really positive things that can come from being confined. But I am curious to find out like, you know, what, what should parents do if they find themselves succumbing to that sort of lizard brain more often? Or if they, if they do, you know, in a moment of weakness, like you said, you know, react and blow up and then, and, and, and have a, a negative interaction or a fight with their child, like what should they do in those moments to, to try and, and, you know, remedy that, that, that situation and to, and to patch that, that wound? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there is a range there, right? I mean, there's the every day we all lose our cool and have too much on our plate and we snap and I, and I will come back and address that. But I want, but I want the listeners to also appreciate that we know, <coughs> pardon me, we know right now that the number of calls to distress lines, you know, I'm an ambassador for children's help phone and the call volumes are through the roof with kids reaching out that domestic violence if you're in an abusive relationship and now you can't leave um, and alcohol sales are up and people who it's not uncommon for, you know, you start being depressed or anxious, which is, you know, the most common uh, mental health illness issues, which are um, heightened when you are under stress like this, then you turn to coping mechanisms um, and self-medicating with alcohol. Now we start getting into violence that ensues um, so there's some, some really terrible situations that, that we have to be, uh, you know, aware of and aware of those patterns and to know that there are, um, here in Ontario, they're, they've just put, actually all the provinces in Canada have put tremendous funding towards more helplines. So, so people should find out what their free helpline is. Of course, you, even though, um, they don't want people going to hospitals, it's always better to call 911 or show up in an emergency room. If you are really feeling like things are out of control for you. Um, but for the, for, for the more, just the average parent who's just like having a bad day and this is all just wearing them thin and it's starting to feel like it's not sustainable that carrying that load and holding it together. And we're having more little breakdowns. Um, I would say first and foremost, you know, if you can just walk away, if you can catch yourself just enough to say, I am losing it, you know, with kids, we draw a little thermometer and we kind of say, you know, you can kind of talk to someone from zero to three and some four to five, you might be able to negotiate an agreement. But after, when you get past a seven on your temperature scale, usually no good is going to, is going to happen. You need to get back into the cool zone for cool, um, the cool thinking cool, rational thinking. So it's really about, can you walk away? Can you take 10 deep breaths, um, go for a walk around the block, put on music, jump into a shower, learn, learn the methods that help you emotionally regulate and, and bring yourself back to, to, to center base. And that's sort of different for, for all different people, but you need to learn a technique for yourself. Um, circle back and apologize if you've lost your cool to say, you know what? I am sorry. I, I did not handle myself well there. I'm under a lot of stress and not that that's an excuse, but I want to apologize. And, uh, and that's good modeling for kids. You know, we all, we all lose it and we all got to clean it up after restorative justice is, is a really important concept. Heal the hurts, heal the wounds. You have a do over, um, you know, but cl cl clean it up. And, um, you know, and then I think just to be aware that if that's happening more frequently, it's time to really 
carve out some time for some self-care and, and boy parents are all people are not great at it but parents are particularly uh challenged at putting themselves first you know i don't want to take time from the kids i don't want to take resources from the family uh, but you really don't have an option now you're you're like a frontline you are like the frontline worker you are like the, the people that are working the emergency line 24 7 trying to triage the family and um the family's not going to work if the leadership isn't working so find out what you need and that could be just getting in your car and going for a half an hour drive and just being out of the house um so that you can reset um you know i meditate i love meditating i journal um i i've been um posting little tips tip of the day on my instagram story just little, little sanity saving tips that everybody can do just shortly and in the moment um but t- but take your self-care very seriously Right, I guess it's like it's like the oxygen masks on an airplane. You know, you got to put yours on first before you can take care of the kids. Because I mean, you need to make sure that you, you that you're taken care of if you're truly going to be a, a, an appropriate caregiver for for others. Absolutely, you know, and so much of kids' sense of safety doesn't come from the outside world. It comes from looking in your face and saying, "Are we okay?" And they're not going to ask the question, but they're going to feel your vibe. They're going to feel your energy. They're going to feel whether or not you are solid or whether you're falling apart. They're going to feel whether or not you need caretaking. They shouldn't be the bigger, <laughs> they shouldn't be the bigger person in the family that, that really creates problems. Mm-hmm. So we really do have to, uh, step up, step up for them in order for them to feel secure. Yeah. And I would imagine also, like we were talking about, you know, with teenage, with teenage age children, being able to have a conversation, not only is a positive thing for, for sort of modeling the importance of that behavior, but also showing that trust and, you know, that understanding and, and valuing that other person enough to say like, Hey, I want to sit you down and let you know, like where I'm coming from or what's stressing me out or whatever it might be. Um, and then empowering them with the feeling of like, okay, this person trusts me. They're being real. Um, and you know, we're that much more relatable because of it. Yeah. I think another tool that parents should think about now that they've got some more time. Um, And if I could only teach one tool to every parent, even though it's a a more complicated one, but I really believe in family meetings that if we make the shift from thinking about like a kid who is misbehaving or driving us nuts and trying to make it personal and thinking that what's wrong with them, why can't they just listen or why did, why do they leave all their crap around or why isn't anyone getting their homework done? Whatever our gripe might be. Instead of seeing it as a child who needs correction, which is kind of where we go to in our brain, but instead say there's things in this family that aren't working, how can we do it better? Which is, a, which is reframing it as a, a problem that needs a solution. And then not feeling like we as the parent are tasked with solving the problem and getting frustrated when we can't solve it on our own, but instead to open it up to the family. And uh, so if you have a family meeting, you have a little agenda, you you know, make them short and sweet, just like a business meeting, sit down after a meal, maybe while people are having a little snack or dessert or something before a family movie, and just sort of say, hey, we got to cover off some some family business here. What are things that people are finding? I always like to start on the positive. You know, what's working well for us? Uh, What are we enjoying about lockdown here? And, and just talk about some positives that are happening because we don't focus on those enough. And then say, where, you know, where do we need some improvement? Where, what, what really snagged us last week? And uh, I, I like to hear from the kids first before I chime up with my list of, of things. But, you know, one or two things that, 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 uh, that didn't go so well. And so it might be that a parent is saying, hey, you know, I really found that we just argued way too much about getting schoolwork done. How how can we tackle this need to to check in around our schoolwork without me having to police it or, or, or creating fights in the family? You know, and then just so now it's a it's a shared problem. And and we get the kids coming up with ideas about how it might look differently. And you say, okay, let's, let's try that for a week. Let's give it a go and see if that's, uh, see if that's any better. And you just kind of keep tweaking it. And somehow, because it's not just you having to deal with kids, it's like our family isn't working and that's on all of us to figure out how to do better. It just, it weighs so much less on your psyche and it's so much more likely to be effective because kids like to have a say in the rules and the agreements that they have to live with. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's like that simple roses and thorns exercise. But again, I, I really like what you're saying in terms of like, you know, recognizing that the family is a family because of all of the component parts. And like you were talking about before, you know, kids are just getting ushered around and being forced to 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 do all the things that their parents are telling them to do. And they don't have many opportunities to sort of contribute um, and, and talk about what it is that's working for them and then what isn't working for them. And then giving them the chance and sort of flipping the script to say like, hey, we want to be proactive with these things. We want to make sure that everybody's feeling good. So, you know, what's working, what's not working, and then let's work together and make a real commitment on all of our parts to try and make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're satisfying everyone's needs. It also really emphasizes the idea that everybody's responsible for a relationship. You know, we get, I would say probably one of the most um, common uh, pain points right now for families, Mike, is, is siblings fighting. That the siblings are, it's not, it's not so much the kids are fighting with their parents, not to say that's not happening, but, but um, parents are saying like, oh, they're just at each other all the time, at least before they, they had, they could go see their friends or they would go off to school and they would get some kind of a break from one another. But now it's just, they're on each other constantly. And again, it's, it's not a parent's job to make their kids get along or like each other, that kids, they have to get the idea that, that they are, uh, they are responsible for the caretaking of their relationship. And, you know, if you don't want your pesty brother to pest you, then maybe you need to find opportunities to, to be kind to him so that he'll leave you alone. And that's not on parents. That's, that's on kids to broker. So, and, and the same, you know, oh, my teacher doesn't like me. Well, we can moan and groan about the teacher, or we could say you're part of that relationship. What could you do to warm up your relationship with the teacher? Each, each one of us is responsible for making some kind of change that can alter the, the temperature in, in, in a relationship or alter the outcome of an interaction. And everyone's always focused on how the other person is wrong or the other person did something bad or the other person's hard to get along with. And we don't put enough focus on, you know what, I, I have some ownership. I have, I'm a stakeholder in this relationship and I'm accountable for its health. And uh, so what, what, what can I do? What little bit, what little part can I do? And uh, I, th I think we need to, to emphasize, think, I think the family meeting helps emphasize that. It's on all of us to get along, not mm -hmm. just the parents. I remember years ago having a conversation with a friend who articulated it in a really beautiful way, I thought, which was that like everyone is the star in their own movie. And recognizing that when there are conflicts and say, like, hey, what is what does this situation look like from their movie? You know, like what 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 part of the story of my story did they not have access to because they weren't part of that whole thing? But recognizing like, OK, there's two sides to all of this. So how can I empathize for the way that they're seeing it or they're viewing it or what what did my actions look like without the sort of, you know, narrative behind it, this contextualized why I behaved in this particular way that they may or may not have understood. And what can I do to sort of recognize my own agency in in making these relationships, whether it's familial or whether it's, you know, a romantic relationship or a friendship or a relationship between siblings or between a student and teacher or whatever it might be, just recognizing the agency that everybody has in maintaining those things and 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 everyone plays a part. Oh my, so, so well said, so well said. I, I was just uh, helping a parent try to understand <laughs> that very, I wish I, why didn't we talk yesterday? Uh, I would have, I would have, I would have used that metaphor. Um, but again, they were fighting over how to do, how to do homework and the parent preferred to do it on, on paper. Cause when she went to school, they didn't have computers and the child who's never done stuff on paper was like, why are you doing that? We're doing it on the screen. And they got into a fight about what's the right way and the wrong way. And each of them thinking they, you know, well, you know, in my movie, everything should be done with tech. And well, in my movie, the right way to do it is to sketch it out on paper. And, and in, in the end, it was just like, not really important, but there they were, you know, shredding their relationship. <laughs> over something, something that two people can have two different perspectives on, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing is, I mean, we've talked about a lot of really, really good stuff um, over the last, the, the, this conversation. And it seems like the, the sort of overarching macro takeaway is that this, this is a scenario that we find ourselves in where there are a ton of unknowns, but the truth of the matter is, you know, there are always unknowns, whether it's, you know, quote unquote, normal life, or it's the shelter at home life or whatever it might be in the, in the most, the most effective and accurate way of, of making it through those situations is to take the time to practice empathy, to give everyone agency, to understand uh, where they might be coming from, or at least give them an opportunity to communicate where they might be coming from so that you can come up with a solution together and you're not carrying the burden of that solution on your own. And you're also not 
you know, trying to step on someone else's toes to give them a solution that they might not necessarily want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I know for people that are perfectionists or for people that are, that, you know, have been successful because they use control as their, as their modality, that this is a challenge. Uh, I think having kids is a challenge, but if we can, if we can say to ourselves where there is pain, that's where I'm going to grow. Um, and, and uh, that, that is a, a truth. If you think about like when you break a bone, for example, the bone doesn't grow back exactly as it was before, it grows back thicker, right? When, you, when, you, when we build muscles in our arms, you lift weights until you literally damage the muscle and then in repairing the, the, the wrecked muscle, it lays down more muscle fiber and you get stronger. So yeah, you know what? When you have kids and you're thrown into COVID, you, you are going to be in pain. You're going to be stressed to the point where maybe some of you gets a little broken. But the, the opportunity for growth that says, wow, you know, I'm realizing that I really need control in my life and I don't do well when there's not control. Maybe that's something I need to investigate. Um, maybe that's my growing edge. Uh, you know, maybe I'm realizing that um, I really need a, um, a external reference and someone to validate that I'm doing a good job and not knowing what it is to be a good mother anymore really made it hard for me to evaluate how I was doing. Maybe I need to look at that external valuation piece that dominates my life and causes me unhappiness when it's missing. So to, to, to be willing to be curious and, and to say that whatever this crisis is, is it's not going to diminish us. It will change us. It will shape us. It'll allow us to grow. And we, we may not be able to appreciate what that will look like until we have some hindsight. Um, but to have faith while we're in it. Well, I think that's a great way to sort of cap all this conversation off. I think this has been incredibly interesting and a lot of fun for me. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to chat with me today. I'm sure all the listeners really appreciate it as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this. I really, really appreciate it, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to chat, Mike. And um, I'm excited to continue digging into your other topic matter as well. And uh, hopefully we'll chat again in the future. Sounds great. Thanks so much again, Allison. All right. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with our guest, Allison Schaefer. For more on Allison, check out her website at allisonschaefer.com. And for more episodes in Biba's Rediscovering Play podcasts, Parenting During COVID-19 series, check out our website at rediscoveringplay.fm or listen in on any major podcasting platforms. As always, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen in and hope that you learned something and also found it entertaining. Thanks so much for rediscovering play with us.